Well, good afternoon. It is the 15th of February 2021 and the last several segments that I've done have pertained to the written assessment for the special agent position and specifically we looked at the FBI's written battery of tests and uh, these have involved the multiple choice or as I call them multiple guess questions and then the writing assessment that is required and um, I've looked at uh, also used an example of one that was given to me many many decades ago uh, so hopefully you found those helpful and passing those tests after your resume is accepted is necessary to moving to the next step which is the structured interview now what is the structured interview well a structured interview is an interview uh, that includes three special agents if you're applying for a federal agent job so if you're applying to the FBI, DEA, ICE, Border Patrol, any of these agencies, it's, it's the same basic setup. You'll have three officers, three special agents. I've been on these panels probably 150 times to 200 times. I've chaired these panels as a supervisory agent. There'll be one agent who's a GS-14 supervisory agent. That was me. And then there were two senior agents, GS-13 agents. So they've been on for a number of years. And the structure of the interview has changed very, very greatly over the years. When I had my interview to be a DEA special agent in 1984, there were no questions required by DEA headquarters. Okay, the, the interview questions were made up by the interviewers. So they would make up all sorts of things such as hypothetical situations. And um, it, it was very, very subjective. Let's just put it that way. They had your background information and certainly there was a lot of room there for bias. Okay, and one interview panel might be totally different than another interview panel and the same applicant could have walked into one city and got a totally different result than they would in another city because it's so darn subjective. It really was just up to the agents whether they liked you or not, whether they thought you would be a good fit. It wasn't really whether they would like you, but whether they thought you'd be a good fit. But as time went on, uh, the interview process changed and there was a good reasons for that. One is to try to eliminate bias. Number two is to try to make sure everyone is fed from the same spoon. And the purpose of the interview, okay, it, it's really threefold. Number one, it's to determine uh, your, your speaking ability. How well do you speak? Uh, how well do you communicate verbally? Number two, it's to allow, to allow them to have some insight into your problem solving skills. Number three, it's an opportunity for you to sell yourself. Okay, now they're not gonna tell you any of that. They're just gonna tell you, we're gonna ask you some questions and you're going to answer them. So you have to understand that this is what they are looking for, more or less. They want to see how well you speak, uh, how well you communicate verbally. Number two, you know, uh, how well you solve problems. Number three, your life experiences. Sell yourself to them. Okay? Uh, as time went on, I would say by the early 2000s, we had a list of questions. It was about 20 some odd questions. And uh, even these questions were not good questions and the answers were not that good. And around 2008, the process changed again. And as it currently is, uh, there is a number of questions and uh, it's anywhere around maybe 10 questions that you are asked. And uh, each question you're given a period of time to answer that question. So one, first of all, the term that it's an interview really is not accurate. It isn't an interview, it's an exam. Okay, there is no interviewing at, done at all. The agents will ask you a question. You think quickly, you structure your response, and you have a period of time to respond to them. Six minutes, eight minutes, you have up to 10 minutes to respond. They're not going to try to flesh out your answer or ask you more questions. They want to see if you can provide how, how quickly you can think on your feet, how well you respond verbally, 
how well you can solve the problem, how well you can apply experiences from your life and um, apply them in the interview and basically sell yourself to the interviewers. Now the interviewers will have a score sheet and they will score an applicant between one and five and if after the applicant leaves they compare their sheets and if anyone is outside of the range that is if there's uh, let's say one one score said three one said four one said five the score is four if one said four one said five and one said one that one is out of range they have to come to some sort of agreement they have to be within range uh, so it's it's a very difficult test actually it's very difficult most of the applicants failed it uh, after they revised it. Now the person who I have seen who did best on this was a woman who had a law degree from Yale and her husband uh, had been a DEA agent who was killed in the line of duty um, and she he was killed in Afghanistan and uh, she subsequently withdrew her application but I've never seen anyone who did better on this thing than she did. So it was because she had uh, Good. She could think very quickly, obviously. Uh, she had good speaking abilities, and she could sell her experiences to us. So first of all, what do you do to prepare yourself for the interview? The obvious, okay? Um, you show up wearing a coat and tie, if you're a man, or a conservative dress, if you're, you're a woman. Um, you get a good night's sleep. Uh, eat breakfast that morning. Uh, remember the interviewers will have no information on you other than your name. They're not going to know who you are, they don't have your background information, uh, and you'll be called in and after they introduce themselves to you, uh, they will ask you a series of open-ended questions and then it's up to you to answer them. So. Again, I'm not allowed to provide any of those open-ended questions, but they're not that hard to figure out. Okay, they're not that hard to figure out. They're, they're questions that will require a lot of thought, but you're also going to have to, uh, it'll require thought, but you have to be able to think on your feet, so you're gonna have to anticipate the questions to a certain extent. Okay? And you're also gonna have to provide insight into how or why you did a specific thing, why, how or why you're choosing a specific course of action or you did a specific thing in your life, and at the same time you want to highlight your experience. Now the question I'm going to use um, is just one that I just made up on the top of my head, but it's similar to those that are given. And the question that I'm going to provide, and this would be given to you by the, the uh, special agent who's sharing the interview. They shake your hand, you sit down, and perhaps the, the second question would be, please tell us about a time in your life um, where you missed an obvious solution to a serious problem. Okay, now the first thing you have to do with this particular question is don't panic, think, okay, because all of us have missed an obvious solution to a serious problem. Okay, So here's what I would say to that. Um, if I was being interviewed today, let's say, first of all, I would clarify, does this have to be something that is in my recent past or my entire life, your entire life? Okay. I would say, well, my current employment, I'm employed as a church deacon, a Catholic deacon. I'm an ordained minister with the Catholic Church. I'm also a director of religious education, and as such, I, I am in charge of a program that imparts religious education to children from kindergarten to the eighth grade. My job involves the recruitment of volunteers, and I have two paid staff uh, who I also supervise. I select texts, I develop the curricula, and uh, it's also my job to measure how well the students do and to make sure that they're prepared to receive their sacraments and to move forward to the next grade. Now every year, uh, this has been challenging, but this last year has been particularly challenging. And the reason it's been challenging is because of COVID-19. As you know, in March of 2020, the schools were closed down everywhere. 
by the order of the governor and that really kind of threw us off of kilter we weren't able to do anything um, and we, we hadn't been in any way prepared for it neither I think was anyone else in the economy um, so all of the public schools the private schools and the religious education programs came grinding to a halt now, during this summer my staff and I met with the pastor and we came up with a procedure where we could resume religious education but without in-person classes and the reason we didn't want to have in-person classes was was simple fact that the Catholic school was going to start up but we were concerned that if we were to have in-person classes students in the classroom uh, it would be using the same space that that Catholic school students use during the week and there would be concern about possible spread of the virus and now secondly I was also concerned that the majority of parents would not want to have their children in an in-classroom setting and third I was concerned about recruiting volunteers what I did and what my staff did but this my my decision my choice I selected a program a computer program which allowed the students to receive instruction on the computer at home and this allowed them uh, hopefully with the help of their parents to complete their lessons and submit them uh, and we could review the lessons and of course if there's any questions they can contact us online the program was not as successful as I wanted it to be some of the students and their families were very engaged some of them were partially engaged and some of them were not engaged at all what I would have done and what I am doing now uh, now that I understand uh, a better course of action I would have uh, and we, we took this corrective action as a result we sent a survey out to parents to see which parents wanted their children to attend in-person classes um, and then we we set up in-person classes on Sunday morning uh, properly socially distanced with temperature taking and all the same health measures that the Catholic school uses and again this is only necessary for those students whose parents want them to be provided instruction by an in-person catechist and uh, who are healthy and with catechists who are, are happy and more than willing to come in and teach the class with all of the requirements and, and that are placed on us by both the diocese and the Commonwealth of Virginia uh, so this is what we did and we found that the students who came into the classes were those who tended to do the worst at home so their parents wanted them to receive the instruction many of them were from Spanish speaking families the families really could not help them with the online class and I think the students would sometimes run circles around the parents so while many of the students the majority remained online a percentage uh, did begin to receive in-person classroom instruction and having thought about it that really would have been the obvious solution uh, I saw how that they did much better once we began the in-person instruction and um, that really is my example okay so that's my response to that you have like no time at all to risk to think up of something structure a response you know look at the different possibilities explain what you would do why you would do it that's the best you can really do now there are courses online where they offer to for a fee to help you do this I think that's a waste of your money to be quite honest with you I would just do my best to prepare now you may receive a hypothetical question especially if you're going to other law enforcement agencies it really isn't just limited to DEA or FBI and police departments love hypotheticals and DEA used to love hypotheticals so here's a hypothetical okay suppose you're a DEA special agent on duty and uh, it's lunchtime and you get in your government car and you drive over to the Dunkin Donuts and you order a croissant and egg sandwich and you're eating in your vehicle 
And as you're eating, a vehicle pulls up next to you. And you look at the person in the vehicle and you see, notice something that's unusual. They're looking around, looking around, looking around like crazy. And then you see the person take out what appears to be a pipe and light the pipe. It looks as if they're smoking marijuana. What would you do and why? Well, I would say I would look at my options immediately. The first option is I'm a law enforcement officer. The condition is I'm a law enforcement officer charged with enforcing the Controlled Substances Act. Now, probably what I've seen is suspicious behavior. He may be smoking marijuana. He may not be smoking marijuana. I don't know what the person is doing. I suppose I have several options. Number one is to do nothing. I don't think I would follow that option. And here's why. I'm on duty. I'm a federal agent. And a person who is using drugs in a vehicle, and based on the facts and circumstances that I've given, I think I have suspicion that he might be using drugs in the vehicle. That endangers other people. Because driving under the influence of drugs is dangerous including marijuana. Um, I certainly wouldn't get out, draw my weapon, and place the person under arrest. Number one, I don't have probable cause at this point. And number two, that's overblown. So here's what I would do. I would walk up to the vehicle, I'd tap on the window, have them roll down. If I notice the smell of marijuana, I'd identify myself as a DEA agent. I'd say, stay here. I would call for a state and local police officer to come. And I would let the officer know and let the officer handle it. That's my answer. Okay. Now, why is that a good answer? Because you provided your different options. Do nothing. Go all out and make an arrest. Detain the person and call the police if it does, in fact, appear that you have probable cause. Okay. Now, why is that the best option? The reason that it's the best option is because... Um, you don't want the person to drive away if they're under the influence. You have the evidence in front of you, okay? You, you have what you saw, his actions, you smell marijuana, okay? So you detain the person, let the local police handle it. It's not a federal crime, okay? So that way, again, you have an answer. You've answered it as clearly as you can, and you've explained your answer. You've looked at the different options and you've chosen an option and you've explained why you've chosen that option. I probably could have done a better job explaining why I chose that option, but hopefully you get the idea. So again, what they're looking for is your ability to reason, okay? your ability to speak, your ability to solve problems, and of course, your ability to sell yourself, your qualifications. Okay? So um, hopefully this has been of some help. I think, uh, again, do not spend your money or your time on the uh, for sale classes that, that promise to help you because number one, uh, you'll disqualify yourself. Uh, and number two, um, you don't really need to do that, okay? Just be prepared for the interview. And I think what I've done right here is just, um, I've given you some idea. They give you open-ended questions that allow you to think, but you have to think quickly. Think quickly on your feet, and then look at your options, explain your options, and explain why you choose what option you've chosen. And do it clearly, do it concisely, uh, do it as well as you can, looking the interviewers in the eye. If you can't look them in the eye, look at their ear, and um, I think you'll do well. You'll at least pass the interview, which is your object, okay? The next one will be on the psychological screening. Um, so that's an interesting uh, topic and we'll get to that one next. So uh, hope you enjoyed it and hope, hopefully it was helpful. Okay, God bless.